Dear Mr. Greengrass, you wrote an extensive book about the history and changes in Europe from 1517 to 1648. In English, the book is called Christendom Destroyed, and in German it will be called Das Verlorene Paradies and will be published as a Thais book in 2018. One of your main arguments in your book is that there was a strong unity or universalism of Christendom that was destroyed during the period of the early modern age. But what exactly constituted that concept of a unified Christendom? Vielen Dank, David, für Ihre Frage. Und ich freue mich sehr, über dieses Buch zu sprechen. Um, uh, the concept of Christendom is one that um, we can easily imagine uh, as being a complete and uni unified whole, but it wasn't. It was just a project. It was never completed. It was always in the making. Um, that's why I, I think the title, A Lost Paradise, may not quite do justice to the book, in fact, but book's titles are always difficult. In Italian, the translation which has just come out has called it Christendom in Fragments, in Fantumi, and I think that perhaps gets the, the, the theme of the book slightly um, better. But at any rate, um, the Christendom that I'm talking about is one that uh, was part of the centrifugal and centripetal forces which are, are fundamental to Europe's history. Um, but certainly from the Central Middle Ages on, um, there was amongst the elites in, uh, in, in Europe, both in the church and uh, in the political um, uh, elites, a, a sense that Europe was held together by a belief community, an ecumeny um, of the Corpus Christi Honorum, um, and that it could be, um, uh, as a concept, um, used to unify, at least at some levels, um, the um, political uh, framework and uh, become a, a way of uniting Europe against the outside world, the Crusades and so forth. Right. And um, well, then in your book, you mentioned several factors that led to the downfall of the aforementioned Christendom. Um, can you tell us what were those factors and how were they intertwined? Mm, the Untergang. Well, it, as I say, it's more fragments than, than, than a complete downfall. But yes, I like to think of history as not being monocausal. Yeah. Uh, it's about interrelated dynamics and how those dynamics work. Of all the things that one can talk about as um, contributing to those dynamics, in this period, they all individually, you can find earlier on in the Middle Ages, and medieval historians will tell you that there was a Renaissance in the 12th and 13th centuries, uh, that there was um, political um, consolidation in states and so forth. All of that's true, but the dynamics which make for change in this period are what counts. And amongst those dynamics, clearly the Renaissance was one of the components, the Protestant Reformation uh, another key component in fragmenting um, Europe. Um, and so too uh, were the, dis was the discoveries of the New World and the continuing crusade, but it doesn't uh, end up being a crusade, against the Ottoman Empire. And one of the big themes of the book is that Europe would not have been discovered without the discovery of the New World, that the two are part and parcel of the same framework. That's to say the emergence and it takes a long time, and the two concepts live side by side, Christendom and Europe. But the emerging dominance of Europe is part and parcel of the discovery of another continent in which Europe, as a geographical framework, without any um, uh, sense of its unity in ideological or religious terms, beyond perhaps a general sense of being superior to other uh, civilizations, um, uh, but that uh, is something which is intimately linked both to America and to uh, the, the Americas and to the Ottoman Empire. Right. Um, so you mentioned the Reformation, you mentioned the expansion, the discovery of America. And how did these changes um, influence the life of ordinary people? Like, how did life feel like for ordinary folks during that time span of major changes? In a book like this, it's always um, important to... Um, counter the tendency to write a high political narrative um, because you feel somehow that you need to get some sense of the overall framework of what happens and the narrative drives the rest. That's why in this book um, I've kept to a sense that the economic, social, ecological changes um, that are fundamental 
drive the rest of the book. Um, and so um, readers, as it were, get through that panorama before they tackle um, or get a sense of the political framework. Um, there are winners and losers, and the enormous changes economically and socially are driven in not exclusively, but in considerable measure by what we would call capitalism, by the huge inflows of silver notably, but bullion, gold and silver, from the new world. Uh, and that drives change, which is very like the change that we know at the moment. There are winners and losers, and the losers are um, in, uh, in, in many ways more hard pressed by the fact that there is a weakening social cohesion. And we can see that in all sorts of ways, but most notably through witchcraft and this sense of um, local communities unable to cope. Right, so you already mentioned like um, us modern citizens of Europe. Um, can you tell us how all these, all these influences um, are, are actually um, part of today's Europe and how they form today's Europe? That's a good question. Um, and we always tend to, um, as historians want to say, that what we're talking about has a relevance. But when you're talking about something which is happening four centuries ago, it's, it's, it's fatally easy to say that the Protestant Reformation, for example, affected the uh, modern world in literacy, uh, in uh, attitudes to um, capital and um, moral um, attitudes too. The problem is that the longer the time span, the more the period in between intervenes and becomes itself an explanation for the changes that you're trying to induce long term. So I'm rather skeptical and rather reluctant to um, uh, see long-term changes. Parallels, on the other hand, there certainly are. There are parallels with a, um, a Europe which ends up in this period as being utterly devastated by inter-state uh, strife and conflict. It's a Europe whose um, economic and social changes lead to enormous divisions. All that we can map onto our own experience and think about it in relation. So lots and lots of parallels. The one thing that I would hold on to though is that we have, for better or worse now, inherited from this period a sense of what Europe is, a geographical um, sense, which um, stays with us. And uh, uh, that's one thing that I think we can attribute to this period. So let's talk about individuals. There are many famous historical personalities appearing in your book, and the influence of people like Martin Luther, Copernicus, or William Shakespeare is undebatable. However, did you come across a historical figure that was highly influential, but is barely spoken about? Hmm. It's a really good question, because when you write a book like this, again, it's very, very easy to present it as a series of um, individuals <clears throat> that people have already heard of, and that you are re-evoking for them in a particular context. How to fit in people who are um, uh, uh, ordinary people, but who end up living extraordinary lives. The book starts with uh, some, someone whom people will never have heard of, a, a Dutchman called David de Vries, uh, who uh, was a, a rather unsuccessful adventurer, a colonialist, um, uh, but who wrote about his experiences. And it's people like him, it's not just the great explorers that are important in this story, it's those people who didn't quite um, make the, um, the, the, the uh, great stand, the status. Equally, the book uh, in the illustrations, um, uh, I was very careful to include an equal number of illustrations of women and men. Um, because there is always a tendency to underwrite the role of women in history, and especially in this period. Um, but this is a period when queens and regents have an enormous influence politically, and it tends to be underwritten. Ma uh, Catherine de Medicis in uh, the uh, turbulent history of France in the late 16th century is an extraordinary woman, utterly extraordinary. And Marie de Médicis, 
um, uh, in the early 17th century. She is illustrated um, in, the, in, in the book. Another extraordinary figure, very controversial, but really interesting. Um, but I like to think too that there are the um, naturalists, the scientists, um, those people who perhaps one tends not to remember, including someone like Matthias uh, Schwarz, um, uh, someone whom people will never have heard of probably, but who left us this extraordinary book of clothes where he illustrates, or has illustrated for him regularly, the clothes that he wears from more or less his um, baptism through to his um, last illness. Um, and um, that's a remarkable record of someone that, through which we can recreate a whole period. And uh, at last, I would like to ask a rather personal question. You live in Great Britain and France, and at the moment you're staying in Germany. So one could say that you are true European. So the question is, and you already mentioned parallels, um, what is your personal view on the developments in today's Europe? Yes, I don't think um, I'm uh, any more or less European than the rest of us. I think we all live uh, currently with multiple identities. Um, and we juggle those identities. Uh, and uh, that's part of being um, uh, in this uh, modern world, just as we're required to be both specialists and generalists all the time. Um, so I don't think there's an elite, as it were, of people who are real Europeans and others who are not. Um, it, we're all um, living with these um, different conceptions uh, uh, of of, of Europe. But that said, this is a political book, of course. Historians write in the present and they're naive um, if they presume that what they're writing isn't emerging from the context and background. This book was written in three different places, here in Freiburg, um, where we are, um, which has this fabulous library, um, a wonderful place to work. Uh, in Paris, in the Bibliothèque Nationale, um, which has one of the world's great libraries too, as you know. Um, and uh, uh, then in um, uh, uh, the UK, um, when I was teaching there through till 2009. So a book that's written in three different places develops three different perspectives. But the dominant perception that I had was the dangers of fragmentation um, within uh, Europe, with all its difficulties, with all its inadequacies as a, uh, a political um, and um, uh, economic union. Yes, but um, we need to be aware of the dangers, the warning um, signs from historical experience. We need to remember that by 1650, Europe was a total shambles. Uh, as a result of bitter, bitter internecine political and uh, social strife. Um, and that's the danger that can happen if we let the centrifugal forces, um, which are hardwired into Europe's history and its geography and its politics, um, get the better of us. So this is a deeply political book. It's a book that's about Brexit, of course. How could it not be? Um, sadly, it wasn't read or, uh, as such um, by um, people in the UK. Mr. Greengrass, thanks for the conversation. It was a pleasure. Thank you.